Hey guys, in this video we're going to be taking a look at a different type of function combination. And this particular type of function combination we're going to refer to as a function composition. So when we talk about compositions here, at least function compositions, I want you to refer to this word composition as its root here. It means to compose functions. Or if you think about the definition of the word compose, it means to put things together. So with these types of combinations, what we're trying to do here is to take the, say, the y values of one function, and we're gonna make those actually the inputs of a separate function here. So what we're gonna do to begin with is just kinda take a look at what we mean by functions in the first place and their rules and how we evaluate them and kind of extend that into our composite functions. So to begin with, I say consider the following functions f and g where f is this linear function 2x plus one and g is also this linear function x minus four. What I'd like to do is just kind of table some values here. So looking at f of x here, let's say if I were to say make a table of values here, I would be able to choose like an arbitrary set of inputs that I could use here, x values that I could plug into this. And all I would have to do is when I plug this in here to find f of negative two, we would just anywhere I see an x in my rule here, which is right there, we would just plug in a negative two and add one to it. So in this instance, we get negative four plus one, which is negative three. Now, I don't have a lot of room here, so I'm gonna not write that in this space here, but in this negative one space, I suppose I could just go ahead and say, well, f of negative one would be two times negative one plus one. I think I'll be able to fit this one in here. We get negative two plus one, which is the same thing as negative one, so I'll box that. If we were to plug in, say, zero, two times zero plus one, our output then would be zero plus one, which is one. If we plug in one, excuse me, we get two times our input of one plus one, which is two plus one, which is three. And then last but not least, if we were to plug in an input of two, we get two times two plus one, which is four plus one, which is five. So you can see that a function, its only purpose really is to take these inputs and map them onto outputs uh, using uh, some rule here, which is what we have right here. So really quickly, let's go ahead and use our rule for g of x, which says whatever your input is, we're going to take that and subtract four off of it. So again, I get to, if I want to here, as long as the domain's not restricted, choose an arbitrary set of x values to plug in. So I'm just going to go ahead and stick around graphically where the origin would be between x values of negative two and two for the moment. And we would see in this case that we always get in this possible rule, the input minus four. So I'm just kind of keen on going ahead and putting these in right now, just to emphasize that all we're doing is plugging in an input and getting an output. So in this case, we would plug in negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And in these particular instances, what we get as outputs would be negative two minus four, negative one minus four, zero minus four, so negative four, negative three is one minus four, and then two minus four would be negative two. Okay, so again, this input output scheme. So in each of these tables, what we're doing is plugging in these input values, these domain values, and getting back our outputs or our y values here. So when we consider a composite function, something kind of interesting happens here. We say for a composite function, we're plugging one function's outputs in as the inputs of the other function here. And so we use the following notations to do this. And it looks kind of interesting, but we look at this as these functions here. I want you to know that these two mean the same thing in terms of meaning. And so the difference is going to be in notation, but I really like this first notation because it emphasizes what we're doing. In this particular instance, I would read this as f of g of x. And what we're looking at is a situation where what we're going to use as the inputs of f are actually the outputs of g. And so looking at this other notation, you notice that it says f in this little circular thing here. It looks like the degree symbol g of x. This is also read as f of g of x. So when you see this little circular symbol here, we really mean the word of, and you can read this as f of g of x. So what I'd like to do is kind of look at this as a mapping. In a normal instance, what we would have is just for a function f, or say for a function g of x, what we're doing is having a rule g, we're plugging in an x, and what we get back is an output g of x, okay? And so this would, this would just be a, a normal g of x function. However, what we're gonna look at is an instance where what I wanna do is take these outputs of g of x and actually make those the inputs of f of x. And so if we were to look at the composition, okay, we really mean in this case f of g of x, 
it kind of looks like this. We would start just by finding the outputs of g of x and then using those to plug into f of x. So in this particular mapping here, it's going to look very similar to what we just did here. We would get some x value and plug this into our function, say, g, and what we would get is some output g of x. And so these are these things that you're seeing here, these, these numbers that you see here. We could take these outputs and technically what I could do is I could say, well, let's make those the inputs for f of x. What would happen if I took these outputs initially for some given x values and made those the inputs of f of x? Well, I could actually go plug those into f of x and get some outputs as the inputs were our g of x values. And so what this looks like is we're going to take this output that we got initially and we are going to plug it in to our rule f here, f, and what we're going to get is, I'm going to make this a little bit wider here, we are going to get an f value at that g of x value. So as a matter of example up here, if I had said let's go find f of g of 2, what this really means is we would really just have to go know what the output of g of 2 is. And looking at our table here, g of 2 came out to be a negative 2 in value. And so looking at this as a mapping, it kind of looks like this. When we plugged in 2 into g of x, what we get is g of 2, which in reality has a value of in this case, negative 2. What we're going to then do is, in turn, make this the input for our function f of x. And so what we get symbolically is f of g of 2, but really what we mean is f of negative 2. And in this case, f of negative 2, well, we already know what f of negative 2 is. We found it right here is negative 3. So you can see that we are just simply using for compositions the outputs of one function as the inputs of another function. And this was a particular example where we did it at a specific x value. What we're going to be seeking to find here today is a rule that would tell us the output of f at the output of g at x, generally speaking. So leaving this a general x instead of a specific x value that we plug in here. Okay. So when you look at something like this, f of g of x, it means that we're taking g at an x value and then plugging it into f. I can say that the quickest way to get here to here then is our composite function f of g of x. Okay. So what we're going to look at then is a particular composition of these two functions here that we had to begin with here. f of x is 2x plus 1 and g of x is x minus 4. So I'm going to, because I'm on a new page here. I'm going to recopy these so that we have them handy for us here. But these are our two functions that we're going to compose with one another. And the very first composition we're going to perform is find the output of f at the output of g at x for any given x value and then state its domain. So the very first thing I'm going to write here is this f of g of x. And the reason why I'm writing it this way is because whenever you see it written this way, which you will, I want you to automatically go ahead and rewrite it as f of g of x using this notation right here. Because what I want to identify is, first of all, what's my inner function, which is this g of x right here. I'll try to fix this a little bit more. g of x is our, we're going to write, inner function. And what we're going to do is evaluate that inner function and then plug it into f, which is our outer function. So, what we would be looking at in this case, if we were to find f of g of x, would be to rewrite it as f of g of x and really interpret this as a function. So when we look at this as f of g of x, what this really means is we are taking f of x's rule and everywhere we see an x, what we're going to do is we're going to use this as the input into our function. So because our outer function is f of x and we're plugging g into it and our rule is 2x plus 1 or 2 times the input plus 1, what we tend to do is we just take out all of the x's and in its place what we're going to do is put in our input which in this case happens to be the output of g at a given x value here. So the very first thing we do for f of g of x is to replace all of the x's in f's rule or the outer function's rule with just the input g of x. 
Next up, what we would have to do is just go ahead and say, well, what is g of x equal to? Well, we have a value for g of x here. So this very same statement here would look like this, where instead of g of x, we can say, well, the rule for the y value at any given x value for g of x is x minus 4. So in this particular case, we would have 2 times this output x minus 4 and then adding 1 to that and then what we would want to do is make sure that we simplify after this and so in this case we get 2x minus 8 and that would be plus 1 and combining like terms we get 2x minus 7. So I'm going to put a box around this and what we're going to say is this is our composite function f of g of x and what it represents is this would be the f value that we would get if we were to plug the outputs of g into f at any given x value. So what I'd like to explore now is what would happen instead of finding f of g of x if we try to compose g of f of x, or in other words, g of f of x written this way. Then we're going to come back and kind of take a look at the domain here. So g of f of x, the very first thing I want to do is make sure I rewrite this as g of f of x. And we're going to identify that f is our inner function, g is our outer function. So what this means is we're plugging f into g. The way this is going to be different is that we are now using the rule for g as our outer function here and plugging into it this f of x. So in g's rule here, wherever I see an x, I'm responsible for putting an f of x in its place because we're using the outputs of f as the inputs in g. So we really do get f of x minus 4, but using this as an opportunity to go ahead and make a substitution here, we know that f of x at any given x value is equal to 2x plus 1. So we're going to make this substitution here, and what we get in this possible instance is 2x plus 1 minus 4 would be combining like terms 2x minus 3, and we would identify that this is g of f of x. So some things. First things first, you'll notice that f of g of x and g of f of x are not the same thing. And so we're going to make a note here that, uh, let's see, f of g of x is not always the same as g of f of x. And that's pretty... Uh, that's pretty much a theme when it comes to composite functions. Now, when I say not always, it means that this will sometimes be the same, okay? But in most instances, well, I don't want to say most, in many instances, you will see that they are not the same, okay? Now, when it comes to stating the domain of these functions here, one thing that I'd like to point out requires me to go back to our last slide, and it simply is just going to apply to or pertain to this figure right here. And so when we talk about the domain of a function, what we really mean is the set of all x values that are put into our function that allow us to get an output for g of x in the first place. So when we talk about the domain of f of g of x, the thing that we want to be clear on is this. The domain of f of g of x really relies upon the domain of g of x, which was our inner function here. Because let's imagine that there's an x value that when I plug it into g, I don't get a g of x value back. Maybe it's imaginary. That would mean that that particular x value is not in the domain of g of x. At the same time, though, if g of x never existed in the first place, because let's say there's an x value that isn't in the domain of g of x, then f of g of x could never exist in the first place. So when it comes to finding the domain, the domain of composite functions, what we want to acknowledge is this. The domain of a composite function, let me, maybe I'll type this, this will look a whole lot better for us here. The domain of a composite function is reliant or, or is is conditional, what's the word I want to use here, is dependent on the domain of the inner function. So when it comes to finding the domains of composite functions, what I'm going to ask us to do is look at the domain of the inner function as being a huge dictating factor as to what the domain of our composite function might be. So in these particular instances, maybe we start with this f of g of x here. f of g of x, our inner function is g of x. And so as we come up here and look at its rule, what we're really scanning for in this particular instance and with this particular chapter is do we see any radicals that have x's on the inside of them? Or specifically, even indexed radicals 
with expressions in X on the inside. Because if that's the case, what we're responsible for doing is making sure that the radicand is greater than or equal to zero. In other words, that we don't plug negative things into an even index radical. Because remember, that gives us imaginary results. In other words, those would be X values that we would want to exclude from the domain if it's negative in there because we would never get a Y value back. So when we look at g of x here as being our inner function, I look at this and I say, well, I don't see any radicals with x's on the inside. So as a result, we would say that the domain would be all real x values here. And I also see that in my composition that I don't see any x's inside of radicals. And so I could also say that its domain is all real numbers here. So when we write the domain, we are going to first examine the inner function's domain and then make sure that the composite function itself doesn't have any restrictions. And so in both these possible instances, we're going to say all real x values would be our domain here. And it's kind of easy to think about this. These are both linear functions. Linear functions always have domains of all real numbers. Down here, our inner function is f of x. And when you look at f's rule, I don't see any radicals that have even indices with x's on the inside. So as a result, we're also going to conclude that it's all real x values as the domain of this function. So what I want to do is I want to perform one more composition with a couple of different functions here. And I did type these, uh, but it's kind of hard to tell what they are with my notation here. So I'm going to rewrite it. We say f of x maybe is x squared and g of x is equal to the square root of x plus 2. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the composition of f of g of x and state the domain, but we're also going to find the composition of g of f of x and state the domain. One thing that I'd love for us to do before we begin is this, and it's just going to make our job easier down the road when we state the domain is, let's just go ahead and state the domain of these initial two functions, since either one of them is going to at one point play the role of the inner function. So f of x, looking at this as our quadratic parent function, we know that those are parabolas and they go left to right forever and ever. So these are gonna have domains of all real x values. But when we look at say this right here, I notice that I have an expression in x inside of an even indexed radical. So remember that if that's the case, kind of scroll over here, we are responsible for taking what is in the radicand, not with the radical, just the stuff on the inside, and saying that it must be greater than or equal to zero. So our method here is to go ahead and just solve this inequality. I could subtract two from both sides, and what I get is our domain, which is we can only use x values that are negative two or greater because otherwise this inner quantity would have to be negative in certain instances. So what we're gonna say here is we're gonna say all x values but we're gonna put a little colon here, which means such that, or it is the case that, okay? And so such that, we would say x has to be greater than or equal to negative two. That means that one of our inner functions has an unrestricted domain, and one of our inner functions is going to have a very restricted domain. So let's go ahead and start with f of g of x here, or, and you know, we might see it written this way, f of g of x, the very first thing we would do is rewrite it into this notation here. So f of g of x, recognizing that f is my outer function here, it means that we're plugging things into f, and specifically what we're plugging in is g of x. And so if f's rule is x squared, wherever I see an x, I have to take that out, and I'm responsible for plugging in the outputs of g. Now, just as we did in the previous examples, we're going to go ahead and substitute g of x's rule inside of this here. And so what I get really is, and let me color code this here, we get the square root of x plus 2 placed inside this set of parentheses where we're squaring it. And any savvy person would tell you when you square a square root, it kind of just disappears there, and we get what was inside the radicand. So I'm going to say or recognize that this is f of g of x. Now we're going to come back in a moment and discuss what we observe about the domain. Let's go ahead and take a look at g of f of x where this time our outer function is g. So to say g of f of x, what we really mean to say is we're going to take the outputs of f and use them as the inputs of g. So because g's rule is the square root of input plus 2, we're going to go ahead and replace all of our x's with our input f of x, which is really the outputs of f. And so again, making our substitution here, we can say that f of x really has the rule x squared. What we really then get is the square root of x squared plus 2, and we're going to identify that this is g of f 
of x. So I'll put a box around this. And now we get to talk about the domain. So now, looking over here on the left, you might scan this and say, look, when I found my composition, I had no x's inside the even index radical or an, an even, and excuse me, inside an even indexed radical. So it might lead you to say that our domain should be all real numbers here. But the thing is, when you look at this inner function g of x, g of x had a restricted domain. And so I cannot tell you that f of g of x has a domain of all real numbers because g of x, which was our inner function, doesn't even have a domain of all real numbers. So when we write our domain here, we are going to use this domain of our inner function and we're gonna say all x values such that, or it is the case that, x must be greater than or equal to 2. So this is why it's important we look at the domain of our inner function. Now when we look at g of f of x, I ended up with this right here, and what I see is I do have x's inside of an even indexed radical. So I'm responsible for taking my radicand, x squared plus 2, and setting it greater than or equal to 0. But one thing I want to tell you right now is this. Because x is being squared, whatever I plug in for x, when I squared, it's going to become positive. And when I add a positive here, positive, plus another positive, the thing is, I'm never going to get a negative value. Which means no matter what I plug in for x here, it's going to give me back a positive inside here. And therefore, all x values are included in the domain. Now, being careful, if you've been listening, you know you have to go back and check the domain of f of x as well. And we already previously listed this as also all real x values. So because our composition and the inner function agree that the domain is all real x values, we can say that the domain of this composition is then all, uh, all x values or all real x values, okay? So when we are discussing compositions, it's this idea that we are going to be taking the outputs of one function and making it the inputs of the other function. And when doing this, just being very careful when we state domains afterward, that we really explore the domain of the inner function because the outer function or the composite function could never have existed if the inner function doesn't exist in the first place. Cheers.